Hey, welcome to the video. I'm so excited for us to learn all about the new interactivity API in WordPress. But before we jump into the lesson, just a really quick 40 second announcement. Uh, this video is an excerpt or a chapter excerpt from my 44 hour full course all about WordPress development. Uh, if you want to join the full course, you can find a link to this site down in the description of this video. The bundle comes not only with the 44 hour WordPress course, but it also comes with uh, my full stack developer bootcamp course, my Laravel course, my MySQL course, and my React course. Also, you'll get access to the private Discord chat community. Anyways, now let's get on to the action. Let's learn about the interactivity API in WordPress. Hello everyone. In this lesson, we're starting a new chapter, which is all about the interactivity API in WordPress. Now, the question is, what in the world is the interactivity API? Well. To answer that question, let's start with a brief history lesson. So back in 2003, that's when WordPress initially released, right? That was, so that was a long time ago. And really from the point that it launched until uh, December of 2018, yes, there were tons and tons of features and updates. However, it wasn't until December 6th, 2018 that we had the block or Gutenberg block revolution, right? Blocks became sort of the heart of WordPress. And for the 15 years in between 2003 and 2018, we got used to working with WordPress in a way that had absolutely nothing to do with blocks. It had no concept of what a block even is. So this was a complete revolution in 2018 or 2019. However, since then, right, there's been like five or six or seven years since then. Um, so we've been building with blocks this whole time for the past half a decade or so. And yes, the admin editor experience, right? Like if I edit this post, yes, the admin editor side has had blocks and client side JavaScript for the super interactive experience, right? Where you add different block types and you can reorder them and you can add, I mean, blocks are incredibly interactive. There's a lot of JavaScript going on. However, on the visitor facing portion of our website, there has never been a WordPress official standardized way of adding JavaScript or interactivity to the visitor facing front end of your website's blocks. Well, the good news is that as of April 2024, we finally have that missing puzzle piece. WordPress version 6.5 added something new, a new system called the Interactivity API. What in the world is that? Well, it's an official WordPress standardized way of adding client side JavaScript or interactivity to our public front facing website and the blocks that it's built up of. This is so exciting and powerful. This is such amazing news because for the past five or six years, developers like you and I, we've had to get creative and sort of reinvent the wheel ourselves. Like if we wanted our blocks to have any kind of client side JavaScript, we were responsible for making a hundred different decisions on how to even implement that, right? So not only choosing like, do we want plain JavaScript? Do we want React? Do we want Vue? Do we want Angular? But more importantly, how can our client side JavaScript interact with the server side data, right? Like the block attributes or the block data for that block instance. Like how do you facilitate that dance between server data and client side JavaScript? So you and I had to get creative and sort of create our own solution. And I mean, talk about decision fatigue, all the decisions that go into facilitating that dance can be exhausting. I mean, and it's been cool to build this block together and set up this front end experience. But this entire time, I have just been counting the days until WordPress had an official standardized WordPress way of doing that. I mean, that's kind of the whole point of using a system like WordPress, right? It's supposed to put our development process on rails. It's supposed to make a lot of these boilerplate or basic task decisions for us. Well, to recap the good news, as of April, 2024, good news, WordPress does make those decisions for us. There's now an official WordPress way of doing that. It's called the Interactivity API. Now, this is just a bit of my personal story or to help you get really excited because I think this is one of the biggest events in WordPress as a developer. Uh, I've always held a tiny bit of resentment or distaste for Gutenberg and the block revolution because the interactivity API, this was the missing puzzle piece for me. In my opinion, blocks should have never been added to the core of WordPress until this puzzle piece was ready, the interactivity API. But anyways, that disappointment of mine is now in the past and today with the interactivity API, I have never been more excited for the future of WordPress. 
This is seriously awesome. This new API renews my interest in WordPress all over again. Instead of needing a headless site built with something like Next.js or needing a library like HTMX or so on and so forth, we finally have that missing puzzle piece. That modern dance between server-provided data and client-side JavaScript is now officially supported and being improved on and polished and cared for by the official WordPress core, and that's all I've ever wanted. So in other words, as a developer, I no longer feel abandoned and left to fend for myself in the WordPress world. I once again feel like WordPress cares about my experience and that I matter. And as a developer, I haven't felt that way since 2018 or 2019 when Gutenberg and Blocks were first added. So to summarize, I am super happy. This is a very special moment uh, for us as WordPress developers. So that's enough history and chit chat. At this point, let's give ourselves a real world task to sink our teeth into. So this block that I've been showing you, right, this multiple choice quiz or are you paying attention block type, let me refresh. So we built this together in a previous chapter uh, and we sort of rolled our own solution and got creative. Well, in this chapter that we're in right now, let's rebuild this block type. We're going to create a new version of it, but this time we're going to build the visitor public front facing experience for it. We're going to build it not using our own custom JavaScript solution. We're going to build it using the WordPress Interactivity API. I think this is going to be a great exercise to fully wrap our minds around what in the world the Interactivity API is. This should be a ton of fun. This is the first time I've been legitimately happy and grateful and joyful about WordPress in about five years. I'm so excited to jump into this with you, and I will see you in the next lesson. Hello everyone, in this lesson we're actually going to get started creating our new block that's powered by the Interactivity API. Let's jump into the action. Alright, so we know that we want to create our block as a new plugin, right? So when you go into your site and click on plugins, we want our new block to appear in this list and then we can activate it and then use it in the post editor or page editor screen. Now, I want to show you my new favorite way of creating a new plugin. Uh, it's using this really cool official package from the official WordPress team uh, called Create Block. Over the years, there have been a lot of third party or community created packages similar to this, but I'm a huge fan of this package because it's coming from the official WordPress team. Anyways, to use this package, we just fire up our command line. On Windows, you can search for a program called Terminal. On Mac, if you look in your Applications and then your Utilities folder, you'll see Terminal. Anyways, in the terminal, we're just going to say CD for change directory and then a space. And then after the space, I want you to drag the folder on your computer uh, that's pointing towards the plugins folder for your WordPress installation. Let me show you the easiest way I think to find that. So in the local WP application uh, for your site, if you click go to site folder, that will open up this area and then go into app and then go into public and then go into WP content and there you should see plugins. So this is the folder I want you to drag onto your command line, right, or your terminal, right? So we have CD space, and then just drag on top of your terminal like this, and then press enter. Cool. So now our command line is pointing towards that plugins folder, and now we can use this official WordPress package to sort of scaffold or build out a bit of boilerplate code for us. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say npx, and just as a refresher, in order to use NPX, you would have need, needed to already have installed uh, Node and NPM on your computer. But we've already done that in a previous chapter and lesson in this course. If you've skipped ahead to this lesson, just know that you can visit the official Node website, right? So just Google for Node.js and make sure you have Node installed on your computer. Anyways, we're going to say NPX and then the name of the official package is at symbol WordPress forward slash create dash block. And then let's say at symbol latest, just to make sure we're using the absolutely newest version, a space, and now make up a name uh, that you want to use as your folder name, right? So like in this plugins folder, maybe I want a new folder in here called um, interactivity quiz. So you could make something up, it could be unicorn, could be pizza, but I'll say like interactivity dash quiz, okay, space, and then dash dash template and then a space, and then finally, at symbol WordPress slash create block slash interactive template. 
So just to review the line as a whole, NPX is how you can use scripts without having to download them first. So it will download the script and execute it. This is the name of the official package at WordPress create block. This is the name of the folder we want to create. And then dash dash template, this flag lets us say uh, like sort of which template, which blueprint from WordPress do we want to use? So we're using the interactive uh, template. Go ahead and press enter. And I can't imagine this would take more than maybe 40 seconds, but go ahead and be patient. Okay, so mine just finished. And what's cool is now you'll notice in your plugins folder, here I have a brand new folder called interactivity quiz. Go ahead and, oh, or whatever you named your folder, but go ahead and open that folder up in VS code. Okay, so you should have a folder named build. It should have already ran NPM install for you. So you have node modules, you have source or SRC, beautiful. At this point, we can go back into our WordPress installation. And if you refresh your plugin screen, so refresh, aha, there we see it, interactivity quiz. You can go ahead and click activate. Let's go test it out. So if I go to one of my blog posts, maybe like yet another post, here's the old version of the quiz that we built, but maybe right above that, uh, let me search for quiz. There it is, interactivity quiz. Go ahead and insert it. You should see something like this, right? It's just boilerplate filler for now, but it says interactivity quiz. Hello from the editor. Let's click update or save that. And then if I view that post on the front end, uh, here it is. It's this filler area, this placeholder area. It says toggle. And if you click it, we see a bit of text. Hello from an interactive block. You can click it again to close it. Cool. Now, obviously in this chapter, we're going to learn all about the interactivity API to make interesting things on the front end of our website like this happen. You know, and we're obviously gonna rebuild this functionality of a quiz, uh, but we're gonna rebuild it using the interactivity API. However, before we get to that, there's a few basic tasks we should take care of first. Uh, let me explain. Let's first worry about the admin editor side. In other words, let's sort of move over this basic admin experience for the block, let's sort of import or export or you know, migrate that over into our brand new plugin. So to get started on that effort, let's go find the folder for the old version of our quiz plugin. So in my WordPress installation in app, public, WP content, plugins, it's this one. We named it, are you paying attention? Uh, now, just to keep it obvious, which text editor is my new one that we're working on together. So this color scheme, this dark purple or this dark color scheme, this is the one that we just created, you know, a minute ago in the command line. However, let me open the old version that we're going to be borrowing code from. Let me open this up in a different text editor. In this one, you can see it's using a light color scheme. This way we just don't get confused. So in our old version of the plugin where I want to borrow or copy code from, uh, if we just go into our source folder, I want to dig into the index.js file. And up at the top here, we don't need to move over this SCSS file reference uh, because our new boilerplate will, will already have its own CSS file. But I want you to copy over these three import lines where we're importing you know, these different components from WordPress. And then on this line, these different elements from the WordPress block editor. And then this line where we're importing our own custom color picker. Just copy over those three import lines into your clipboard and then back in VS code, this new folder that we're creating together in the present moment, let's go into our SRC folder and go into the edit.js file. Cool. Up at the very top of this file, you can just paste in your clipboard and hit save. Okay. And before we go any further, let's be sure to install uh, react color. It's just a package that should be in our package.json file. So just open up your command line in VS Code. So command J and just say NPM install and its name is react-color. Cool. You don't need to do this. Um, the idea is just that our previous code that we're borrowing for this admin experience, right? Like when you click on it, then you can change the color. And again, WordPress has built in color picker components. However, so again, this has nothing to do with the task at hand. You don't need to use the React color picker. This was just from one of our older previous chapters and lessons together. And I'm just moving over or sort of migrating the old code. Cool. All right. And then what about the actual JSX? Um, so like this code that has, you know, the question and the answers and the delete buttons. Uh, that's what we would want, right? The JSX instead of just a paragraph that says, hello from the editor. Well, in the code that we're borrowing from, so back in this app, if you scroll down towards the bottom of index.js, 
I'm looking for this area where we have return and we're just returning a bit of JSX. So here's what I would do. Just select from the start of the word return here and then just scroll down. And then at the end of this closing parentheses, so right there, you can hold down shift and click at the end of that. So just select the entire uh, return and opening and closing parentheses, copy that into your clipboard and then back in VS Code. Uh, within our edit.js file, let's scroll down. Uh, aha, so for me it's around line 45, but there you see, uh, right, we're returning a bit of JSX. Go ahead and completely replace that. So in other words, re replace one return parentheses, paste it in with another return parentheses. Okay, and before we save this and test it out, I can tell you right now this code would not work at the moment because our old code is referencing things like props.attributes, right, or props.set attributes. However, uh, the new boilerplate code from our, you know, that was auto-generated, it's destructuring the incoming props object. Um, so there's nothing wrong with this new approach. This new approach is actually really clean. But in order just to play, play along nicely with our old code that is looking, you know, for things like set attributes and attributes on the props object, in our function here, I would get rid of the curly brackets and destructuring, and I would literally just have the word props just like this. Again, just to be clear, there's nothing superior or better about this approach. It's just to play nicely with all of this existing code that we just copied and pasted over. Cool. Also, before we save this, if we go back to the code that we just borrowed from, uh, within the overall function that named edit component in this old code, right, there's props. Before the return line, let's actually be sure to copy over these various functions, right, like update question, delete answer, mark as correct, so on and so forth. So just um, for me, it's around line 57 on the code we're borrowing, but just from that function down to just right before the return lines right here, just copy that back in VS Code, uh, just right above the return line. Go ahead and leave this const block props equals use block props, so right about here, just paste it in. Let's save this and test this out. Right now, I can let you know that it's not going to work perfectly. Uh, we are going to want to use this block props, but I, let's see if it works at all. Let's just see what this gets us. So save that, and then in your command line, uh, we're going to run npm, and then you could say run start, but specifically the keyword of start is reserved, so you don't need to say the word run if the script is named start. You can just say npm start. Cool. So now with that up and running, you might just need to hit command save on this file one more time to trigger the task, but that's going to rebuild things, and let's go see if we get an error message or what we get, right? So if I refresh um, the edit screen, let's see what happens. Aha, uh -huh. this block has encountered, encountered an error. Let's look at the console. So if you inspect, go to the console. Aha, uh -huh. so we're having trouble accessing the map function. Uh, we would expect it to be an array, but it's currently undefined. I'm so glad we ran into this error together. This perfectly segues into what we need to look at next. So in our SRC folder, I want you to look at block.json. Cool, so in this modern approach to creating blocks, you can see we're using API version three, and this, Strategy lets us spell out all sorts of details about our block from within this convenient block.json file. So the reason we're running into this error, uh, if you go back into our code here in edit.js, and if you search for like where we're using map, uh, so we would expect answers to be an array. The problem is that we just need to set up um, an attribute named answers so that it's an array and at least starts with an empty value. Now, we've already had that in our old code. So if you go back to the code we're borrowing from, and you scroll up to the top, and for me it's around line 29, but you can see where we're saying, you know, WP blocks dot register block type. This is where we have things like the title, the icon, the category, but more importantly, we have attributes. Right? And you can see that answers, its default value is just an empty array. So what I would do is start selecting the word attributes and then its entire object value like this, copy that into your clipboard, and then back in VS Code in your block.json file. And again, be sure you're in the SRC folder. Uh, but let's just look. It doesn't look like there is an attributes uh, property yet. We can go ahead and add one. Doesn't matter exactly where, maybe you know above category or below category, and then just paste in your clipboard. Uh, be sure to add a comma at the end of what you just pasted in, and then we do need to wrap attributes in a starting quote and a closing quote and then you also need to do the same thing like for all of these right like quotes here quotes there quotes here 
just basically wrap everything in quotes because this is no longer living in a JavaScript file, it's living in a JSON file. So you would need to do the same thing here, right? Like quotes around that, quotes around this. I really would love to find a way that, uh, some sort of VS Code extension that could just fix this for us automatically. Uh, but let's do the same thing, uh, you know, for the word default. Just wrap all of these in quotes. Cool. And then you can see I'm getting an underlined error for undefined. Again, because we're not in a JavaScript file, we're in a JSON file. Instead of undefined for this correct answer, let's just set that to an empty pair of quotes like this. Cool. Let's go ahead and save this. And now if we refresh the admin editor screen, beautiful. Let me hide the console so we actually have some screen real estate. It's almost working, right? So this, we see the layout. However, you might notice that if I click on this block, it's not selecting it, right? Like currently if I click on the old version, it highlights it with a blue border and it lets you change the background color. But if I click on this one, nothing happens. Um, let me show you the solution to this. In this newest version, this API version of three, all we need to do is have sort of a wrapper div. Let me show you what I have in mind here. So back in VS Code in our edit.js file, where we're returning a bit of JSX, we currently have this, this overall div outside of that or right before that, let's have another wrapper div. So just div, and we do not want the closing div right there. So delete that automatically inserted closing div. Go down to the very bottom of our JSX. And just after that closing div, div add one more closing div. And now check this out, back on the opening div, let's say uh, curly brackets and then dot, dot, dot block props, oops block props. If you're wondering where this is coming from, it's just coming from the boilerplate code inside our edit function. Uh, we have this const variable block props, use block props. Cool. So if we save that now, if you refresh WordPress will handle uh, the class and the on click behavior so that when you click on it, awesome, you get the blue border, but also now we can change the background color. Like it, it actually recognized that it's selected over in this block right hand column. Cool. However, I'm not liking this weird uh, extra padding and beige color. So let's go remove that. That's from that boilerplate code. Um, so in our SRC folder, there are two CSS files, editor.scss and style.scss. Editor only is applied to the admin editor side and then style.scss is used for both the admin side and the visitor side. So in style.scss, that awkward uh, padding and beige color, that's coming from style.scss. So you can just delete that little bit of code, hit save. And then in editor.scss, I don't think this is necessary either. So let's just delete that, hit save, and see what that gets us. So if we refresh, cool, that looks a lot better. However, we're sort of cheating. This is receiving the styling uh, or the CSS from this plugin instance. So in order to really get this to work, let's delete um, the old block type, like just remove it entirely from the page. And then let's go one step further. I'm actually going to go deactivate that plugin um, because it's in queuing or loading certain CSS files and even dash icons and different things for us. And we want to make sure that our new plugin is doing those things, not just relying on the old plugin. So I would just go into plugins and find the, are you paying attention quiz and deactivate that. Now let's go back into the editor and see what things are looking like. Yes. So you can see, uh, this is not looking good. So what we would need to do is go into the code that we're borrowing, uh, the, the folder that we're borrowing code from, and just uh, open up index.scss and just select everything in this file, copy it into your clipboard, and then back in VS Code in editor.scss, just paste it in. Let's go ahead and hit save. If we refresh, awesome. It looks like even the star icons are loading correctly, cool. I do know, I think WordPress just fixed this in 6.5.2. I do know that when 6.5 first launched, you did need to spell out your CSS dependencies explicitly. So back in block.json, if you look for editor style, for me, it's around line 23. You, in the past, in order to get this working, you would need to have this be an array. And then in, in addition to including, you know, your index.scss file. So comma, you would also need to have like quotes dash a cons. Save that. You refresh. Cool. I'm assuming the WordPress core team has already fixed that bug. So you don't need that in place. Uh, but if you ever run into that bug again, that's how you would fix that. That's how you get the dash a cons to correctly work.
Really quick, I'm noticing there should probably be a little bit of margin uh, below our block. So maybe in editor.scss on the overall rule, I would just say like margin bottom, maybe like 20 pixels. Let's see what that gets us. Cool, I think that looks good. Let's fill this out. So I'll say like, um, what sound does a dog make? And then I'll say like, meow as one answer, add another answer, let's say oink, and then let's have the third answer be bark. And then this is where you select which one is correct. So I would click on the star for bark. Uh, with this block selected, maybe I'll choose like a really light green as the background color and click update. And then if I view this on the front end, uh, clearly it's still just this toggle uh, and we deleted the CSS so you don't see the beige color anymore, but yes, you can toggle it. So I realized this lesson was, was just, you know, moving over code, but now we're perfectly set up, right? We've imported the admin editor code um, so that, you know, this is working on the admin side. We're correctly successfully saving the data, like the question and the three answers and which answer is the correct answer. So now is the fun part. Now in the very next lesson, let's actually start learning how in the world do you work with that data? How do you use the interactivity API uh, to make client side JavaScript do its job? This is going to be a lot of fun to set up and I will see you in the next lesson. Hello everyone. In this lesson, we're going to answer the questions. What is context and what is state? A bit of a spoiler, these are essential concepts within the interactivity API. Let's jump into the action. All right, now in this lesson, let's not worry right away about building the quiz interface on the front end, right? Like the multiple choice uh, where you select the right or wrong answer. That can come in just a bit. In this lesson, let's prioritize genuinely understanding how the interactivity API works and how it renders content to the screen. So to that end, let's start on adding our own button uh, that says like, click me. And let's learn, uh, number one, how to have something happen when you click on it. But number two, how to tie the event of clicking on a button to something happening on the screen in this new universe of the interactivity API. So let's do this. In our VS Code folder, right? Uh, I named mine interactivity quiz. Uh, but in our SRC folder, I want you to jump into render.php. Okay, and then before we forget, before you start modifying this file, uh, if you save changes, nothing will happen unless you have a task running down in your command line. So be sure to open up your command line and you need to say npm start. Go ahead and press enter, then you can hide your command line. But now anytime you save a change to any of the files in the SRC folder, uh, that task will automatically sort of copy and prepare them over into the build folder. And that's what WordPress is actually using. Anyways, in SRC uh, render.php, let's do this. So for me, it's around line 17, uh, but the idea is that this is the overall wrapper div for our block. You can see the boilerplate code has already added a bit of stuff to it. You could dig through this boilerplate to try to understand what's going on, but if you're anything like me, you learn 10 times better by sort of starting from scratch and actually spelling it out and typing it out and seeing it come to life yourself. So believe it or not, I would actually just delete this entire div. So from line 17 down to 39, I would just delete all of that. Cool. We also don't need this unique ID paragraph line, but keep in mind, we don't want to delete this closing PHP tag here. We want to leave that, but just you can get rid of the unique ID line and the comment. Cool. Now below the closing PHP tag right here, down here, we're in HTML. Let's build out that div ourselves. So, you know, opening and closing div. Inside the div, let's have two elements. Uh, first of all, let's have like a paragraph that says the button below has been clicked zero times. And then below that, let's have a button and it can just say, click me. So if we save this and refresh the front end, perfect. Uh, the button below has been clicked zero times. Now clicking it doesn't do anything. And that's because we haven't worked with the interactivity API yet. This is just plain old fashioned 1990s HTML coming from a PHP file. In order to add JavaScript interactivity to this, check this out. On the opening button tag, let's say data dash WP dash on equals quotes. Now, let's explain what's going on here. So this is a data attribute or, you know, an HTML attribute. And in modern HTML, you're free to say like data dash pizza or, you know, data dash unicorn equals blank. 
Um, so the data dash is standard HTML. But then obviously WordPress and the interactivity API, they have all sorts of different uh, attributes like WP on, WP init, WP bind, WP class, WP watch, so on and so forth. I won't bore you. Uh, but this WP on, this is how you can set up like an event handler. So in these quotes, we just tell it which function we want to run uh, when this event fires. So check this out. In these quotes, we're actually going to say actions and then look inside that. It's a JavaScript object. So dot. And then you could name it anything, unicorn pizza. Let's call it like a uh, button handler. I'm just making this up. Now, I will let you know, we didn't say click um, or scroll or hover. So after data dash WP on, you do have two dashes and then click. So it's still just part of the attribute, but the idea is this modifier, right? Dash, dash. And then instead of click, this could easily be, you know, like on key up or scroll or hover. I'm not sure all of the exact names that the WordPress API has, but I can let you know that click is definitely one of them. So when this event happens, uh, we're going to run this function in response. So you can save that, but now you're probably wondering, well, Brad, where do we define this function named button handler, right? We're looking in a JavaScript object named actions. What in the world does that even mean? Well, in your SRC folder, jump into your view.js file. Cool. So you can see uh, there's a store and it has a property called actions and callbacks. So in this actions area, the boilerplate code has an action named toggle. We would just now manually add an action named, what did we call it? Button handler. So check this out. Inside this actions object, right above the toggle line, you could say uh, button handler. This could have literally been named anything, but colon, and then just give it a function. So you could give it an arrow function. Be sure to have a comma after that closing parentheses, or excuse me, curly bracket. And now for now, just as a quick test, let's have an annoying alert pop that pop up that says like, hello there. Okay, now we can save this, but I can let you know out of the box, this will not work uh, because we need to somehow tell WordPress to tie the, or connect the dots between like this HTML and this JavaScript file or this store. So with everything saved, if we refresh, this will not work, right? I click the button, nothing happens. So the way that you connect the dots between your HTML and your store is simple. Notice that our store in, in JavaScript is having a label or a namespace of create-block. Well, in our HTML, on our overall wrapper, let's just give it that same matching namespace. So you just say data-wp-interactive equals, and then that same matching namespace, so create-block. It doesn't need to be create block. That's just what our boilerplate uh, plugin is using out of the box. But now that this value matches uh, this value in our JavaScript store, WordPress has connected the dots and now all sorts of magic can happen. So now if we go back and refresh, now when I click that button, awesome. This may not seem like much, but now that the dots are connected between PHP HTML and JavaScript, the sky is the limit. This is so cool. Why is this so cool? Let me show you. Let's imagine we actually want to increment this value, right? So it says clicked zero times, but every time you click this button, instead of just that annoying alert pop-up, let's increment this number. Before we worry about the button modifying that value, let's first just have this simple paragraph output a number here from a dynamic source. Like instead of literally hard coding this to zero right here, here's what you would do. On our opening div tag, let's do this. Let's say data dash WP dash context equals quotes. In the quotes, let's give it an object, so curly brackets, and let's make up a label name for a property. You can name it like pizza or unicorn. This doesn't have to be anything special. I'm making it up, but I'll call it like uh, click count colon, and let's just set it to an initial value of zero. Actually, just to prove our point that this is working, let's set it to something else like the number 20 or 100. Uh, now let's output that or render that here. So instead of this hard coded zero, I'd probably have like a span element and then don't actually type anything in the middle of the span sandwich. Instead on the opening span, let's say data dash WP dash text equals quotes. And then you would just say context dot and then whatever we named it. So we named it click count. So click count. If you've ever worked with React or Vue or Angular, uh, you might be familiar with this term of state. 
In the WordPress Interactivity API, context is essentially local state. It's state for this specific element or this block instance. Now, the Interactivity API also has something called state instead of context. We'll talk about that later. We will absolutely use state uh, for a more advanced feature, but I'll just let you know, because this is something that confused me when I first learned the Interactivity API. Nine times out of 10, and especially if you're doing something with a specific instance of a block, context is the right tool for the job, not state. You really want to get in the habit of using context. Anyways, let's give this a save and test it out. So if I refresh, whoops, that is absolutely not working. I'm glad we ran into this error together. So a few things, when you say data-wp context, instead of wrapping this in double quotes, let's wrap it in single quotes. So open and close the quote there, and then closing quote there, just single quotes. And then for your properties, you wanna wrap those in double quotes like this. So wrap, click count, and double quotes. Cool, set it to 20. We can give that a save. Now if we refresh, beautiful. Now that this is pulling from context, it's gonna be really easy to increment it uh, anytime you click this button. Check it out. All we would need to do is go into our view.js file, and we already have this button handler function. So instead of the annoying alert, all we would do is this. So get rid of that alert. We would just want to modify the context value. Now, context, believe it or not, is actually not just available to you out of the box. You do need to uh, use this utility function uh, that WordPress makes available to us called get context. So within our uh, button handler function, I would say, I mean, obviously you could just copy and paste this line, but I would say const context equals and then call get context. Now that we have context, we can just say context dot click count plus plus to increment it. That's it. Let's go ahead and save. We refresh, click the button. We are in business. This is awesome. Now, if I refresh and it goes back down to 20, I want to show you something really cool. And this is why, I mean, this is the most excited I've ever been about a new WordPress system. If you right click and click view page, let me click up here so you can see. If you click view page source, so no JavaScript has been applied, uh, right? This is just the raw HTML, static HTML that the server is sending to the client. If you search for uh, clicked, yeah, like the button or clicked, you can see that this span is not empty. Right now, we know that it is empty. If you look at our HTML, that span is absolutely empty, and then we're expecting client side JavaScript to populate it. However, WordPress on the server side is pre populating that before it even sends over the HTML to the browser. This is really cool. I mean, for me, this removes the desire for me to use something like Next.js to build a headless website. We finally have bridged that gap in the WordPress universe between getting the benefits of client-side JavaScript, plus the benefits of server-side rendered HTML for speed, accessibility, and search engine optimization reasons. This is the best of both worlds. This is the having your cake and eating it too that I've always, always, always wanted in the WordPress world. So this may not seem like a lot, but trust me, this is the possibilities that this opens up is so cool. Anyways, now that we've tested that out and we've proved that it's working, let's set that back down to zero. So instead of 20, I'll put it to zero. Cool. Anyways, the idea here is that context is the state of our application, it's the data, and by modifying it and by also rendering it out, all of the dots are already connected for us. Things just get automatically updated and rendered. This is super cool. Now that we've seen these basics in action, before we bring this lesson to a close, I do want to explain um, the difference between state and context just a little bit. So context is the state for this instance of the block. In other words, what if you went into the, uh, the admin dashboard and added like five or 10 instances of our block type? Context is local to each instance. Like each instance of that block gets its own totally separate, unique context. However, what if we had like 10 quiz questions and we wanted a, a, a bit of text up here in the corner that says, you have successfully answered three questions correctly, or five questions correctly, or eight questions correctly. That would need to be shared amongst different block types, or I should say amongst all the different instances of blocks. So in other words, when you need something sort of global that's bigger than just the specific instance of a block, that's when you would use state. State is global or universal. 
context is just for an instance of a block. Don't worry, once we build out the quiz interface, we're also going to build out another block type called like solved answers text or whatever. And that way you could have like a block above or below your quiz that says you have answered three quiz questions correctly or five quiz questions correctly. Cool. In other words, if at this moment in time you're not crystal clear on the difference between context or state or what in the world is going on, that's totally fine. That's normal. That's to be expected. We will go over those concepts again and again. So don't worry. Awesome. Now let's keep our momentum rolling. In our very next lesson, let's actually start building that quiz interface. This is going to be a lot of fun, and I'll see you in that next lesson very soon. Hello, everyone. In this lesson, we're going to start actually building the front end for our block. Let's jump into the action. All right, in our previous lesson, we set up this interactive text. Every time you click this button, it increments this count. However, what we actually want to build, now that we understand the very, very basics of rendering in, in, in the interactivity API, what we actually want to build is the front end experience where you have to guess the correct answer to the question. So let's start building out that actual design. So back in VS Code, in our SRC folder, let's go into render.php. And currently, we have this top level div. And this has nothing to do with the interactivity API, but let's get it looking good visually, right? So just like CSS and a class name, so on and so forth. So I would say like class equals quotes and then class of pay paying attention dash front end. Okay, you can get rid of this paragraph and the button, but in this div, uh, let's have a paragraph and we can say like the question will go here. And then below that, let's have an unordered list. And then inside there, we'll have list items like, you know, answer one, answer two, and answer three. Cool. So if we save that, and then be sure to, in your command line, run npm start. Okay, leave that running. And then if we save that and refresh, that gets us this. But let's make sure we have the styling in place. So all you would need to do is go into the SRC folder, jump into style.scss, and then we just need to go into our uh, old version of the plugin. So I have a different editor that I have open here, right? An earlier chapter when we built uh, the quiz block type using plain JavaScript, and just go into frontend.scss. I would just select everything in this file and then paste it in here. Cool. So as soon as I save that and then refresh, awesome. That already gets us you know, 90% of the way there, or basically 100% of the way there. Uh, now, before we worry about making sure that whatever color you select uh, actually appears as the background, before we get to that, let's first just try to output the question text. I'm starting with the question text because there's nothing interactive about this bit of data or text. We don't need client-side JavaScript. We don't need interactivity. We can just use, you know, old 1990s PHP or HTML to output the question. So let me show you how you would do that from within render.php. Up here, the boilerplate is pretty cool. It gives you a bit of reference or documentation, and it lets you know that just dollar sign attributes is available to us. Um, so check this out. Down here in our PHP, I mean, this doesn't even have anything to do with the interactivity API yet. Uh, don't worry, we'll get to that soon. But for the paragraph text in here, you can just say, uh, you know, like go into PHP and then echo dollar sign attributes, square brackets to look inside that array, uh, the associative array quotes, and we want the property or you know the item in the array that has a label of question. So if you save that and refresh, awesome. What sound does a dog make? That is the real dynamic data coming from this instance of the block. Now, you might be wondering, well, Brad, how did you know to look for that attribute of question? Well, the real answer is because I'm the one who created even the admin editor side of this block. So I know what uh, attributes it has. However, I want to show you a cool trick, or it's not really a trick, but something that I do quite often is above your block or anywhere in your block, it doesn't matter where. Uh, but in PHP, you can use print underscore R and then just give it, uh, in this case, whatever you're curious about, like in my, in our case, dollar sign attributes. And that's going to output a human readable bit of data. And that lets you see what's in the array. So that way you can see, okay, there's one property named question. Okay, there's another property named answers, which is an array, right? There's three different answers. Uh, there's also a property named correct answer. And arrays are zero based. So two actually means the third choice. 
So obviously bark is the correct choice, so on and so forth. And there is the background color, right? BG color. Cool. So that's how you can figure out what is in the array. Before we move forward and start looping through and outputting the three hypothetical answers here, uh, let's first get the background color uh, dynamic for this, right? So like if I choose uh, like it's really light purple, click update, we want to use that value uh, here instead of the gray. So back in VS Code, and again, this still has nothing to do with the interactivity API. Don't worry, we'll get to that soon when it comes to actually, you know, clicking on one of the answers. But for this BG color on the overall div, I would just say, you know, style equals quotes. In those quotes, I would say background dash color colon. And now to output that, instead of like hashtag and then a color code, I would just jump into PHP, close out of PHP, and just echo dollar sign attributes, look in that array with square brackets, quotes for BG color. Cool, so if we save that and refresh, awesome. There's that exact purple shade. And at this point, I'm happy with the way things look. We've taken care of the visual styling or the CSS. Now let's worry about the actual task at hand. How do we display the real three answers? Or, you know, it could be two answers or four or five answers. But how do we display the real answers, these real data values of meow, oink, and bark, or whatever they are, uh, in this list? Like, how do we loop through that within the interactivity API? Well, before we can loop through something or, you know, like use a for each or an each loop, before we do that, we need to make sure that our block has the appropriate data. Let me explain. So we know that our array of attributes has this array of answers. However, if we look at our render.php file, in order to loop through that here, we would need to make sure that one of its parent elements has it set as the context. Right now, currently on our parent element, the div, we have data WP context. And remember for our click increment example, we had click count zero. So instead what we would want now is like a property named answers and then an array with, you know, oink, bark, meow. Uh, however, you and I don't want to have to manually hard code or spell that out, uh, right? That's coming from PHP. That's these real dynamic data values that we can't predict. So here's what's really cool. Do this with me. On the opening wrapper div, get rid of this data-wp-context and its whole value. So just get rid of that entire attribute value pair. And in its place, do this. So notice I'm still like inside the opening div tag. Like this is where you could say like class equals or any kind of attribute. Instead, I want you to drop into PHP. You can close it out and do this. Say echo. And this is the coolest function I've seen in a long time in WordPress. I was so happy when I first saw this function. It's called WP underscore interact. It's a little bit hard to spell. Interactivity underscore data underscore WP underscore context. Parentheses to call that. In these parentheses, you give it a PHP array, and then automatically it's going to convert the PHP array into a JavaScript array. We'll be able to visually see what it does in about 10 seconds from now, uh, but just for now, Let's give it a value of dollar sign attributes. Go ahead and hit save and then refresh on the front end visitor part portion of your website. And then go ahead and right click uh, on the background area and click inspect to open up your dev tools. And here's the opening wrapper div. And this is what it did. So that function, it automatically output uh, data dash WP context, just like we manually had when we had a click count. And then it converted the PHP array into a JavaScript object, right? With the same type of like labels, like question and answers and correct answer and BG color, uh, so on and so forth. So now it's really easy to access this from JavaScript, right? Our context literally has a property named answers uh, with the three answers in its array. So check this out. Right now, let's try to loop through that um, so that the three real answers appear here. Here's what you can do. Let's find our unordered list. We don't want fake uh, three list items, so you can get rid of that. And instead, have an opening and closing template element. So opening tag, uh, matching, closing tag of template. And then on the opening tag, we can say data-wp-each equals quotes. And then what do we want to loop through? Essentially like a for each loop? Simple, we just want to look in our context. It's a JavaScript object, so look inside it with a dot and just look for answers. 
Cool, now inside the template sandwich or the template element, so right about here, check it out. We can just have like a list item, so li hit tab. And then let's leave uh, the content empty, like in the middle of the sandwich, leave it empty. But on the opening list item tag, let's say data-wp-text equals, and then I wouldn't expect you to intuitively know this yet, but I can let you know that to sort of get the item that's currently been looped to, right? Normally that's gonna be some type of like parameter name. In this case, you, you access it by saying context.item. So it's dot item for the currently looped to item. But if you save that and refresh, aha, we have the actual values. Now what's really cool in this, I could not believe this. This blew my mind the first time I saw this. If you right click on the page and click view source, view page source, and if you search for like oink or bark or one of those answers, not the raw data, but if you look down, there's our opening div, there's our unordered list. Yes, there's the template, but this is what I'm trying to show you. The three list items, no JavaScript has ran yet in this view source. This is the HTML that WordPress, the server is sending over. It actually pre-populated it the inside of the list element with the real content. This is so cool. For SEO reasons, for accessibility reasons, for page rendering speed reasons, it's already there as just plain old fashioned 1990s HTML. However, then client side JavaScript comes along and WordPress sort of connects the dots and makes that same data available from a JavaScript perspective. Let me explain what I mean. Now let's add on click event handlers uh, for the list items. Let me show you what I have in mind here. On the opening li tag, uh, let's give it a data attribute of like data dash wp on dash dash click equals quotes. And this doesn't exist yet, but let's say actions dot, uh, let's call it like guess attempt. Let's save that. And then we do need to go into our SRC folder and go into view.js. As you might have guessed, we just need to give an action or create an action with that matching name of guess attempt. Um, so we can get rid of button handler, right? That was the click count increment function. You can get rid of that. And instead, uh, what did we just name it? I already forgot. Uh, guess attempt, yes. So guess attempt colon, just give it an arrow function. So parentheses, arrow symbol, curly brackets. Be sure to end that with a comma. And now check this out. Let's say const context equals get context. And then just so we can see what we're working with, let's say console.log context. Uh, so now in the browser, if you refresh and open up your dev tools and go to the console, and now if I click on meow, awesome, we get an object and it says item meow. If I click on oink or if I click on bark. So the reason this is so exciting for me is th these values exist in the good old fashioned HTML, right? The server initial server rendered HTML. But then JavaScript takes over and everything sort of gets hydrated into the JavaScript context. And now we have the best of both worlds. So now that each time you click on one of these, we're logging the value that got clicked onto the console, you can use your imagination. You can see how we might set up the logic to see if the one you clicked on is correct or not. However, before we get into that, uh, let's save that for the next lesson because I want to discuss in detail in the next lesson with you when it makes sense to loop through things like this from a interactivity API JavaScript standpoint, and when it might make more sense to loop through an array like this with traditional PHP. Trust me, there is a method to my madness. Uh, there are a lot of tutorials about the interactivity API that would have quote unquote covered more ground in the first hour, but I want you to genuinely understand not only how it works, but why it works or why we're using the tools that we're using. Perfect. So in our very next lesson, we're going to talk about the different looping options that are available to us. And we'll also start making uh, the logic of whether your guess is correct or not come to life. Let's keep our momentum rolling and I'll see you then. Hello everyone. In this lesson, we're going to start actually evaluating whether the clicked on answer is correct or incorrect. And in order to have that happen in an elegant way, I'm going to sort of blend or merge together both interactivity API approaches and traditional PHP server side approaches. Let me show you what I'm referring to. All right, so in our previous lesson, we used the interactivity API way of looping through an array and doing something once for each item in that array, right? That's how we output uh, the different answers. Right, and so if you went in here and added a fourth answer, if you added a fourth answer called like moo, 
and then clicked update and refreshed, it automatically loops through that. So now there's four choices. Let's go look at the code that made that happen. So in SRC, if you jump into render.php, we used a template, and then this is the interactivity API way of looping, uh, data-wp-each. Now, this is a great tool to have in your toolbox. And if the data that you were trying to output was actually going to be mutated or updated in real time based on state, this would 100% be the correct tool for the job, right? Like if you had a checklist or a to-do list and by the user clicking on things or typing into fields, your list was going to update. Like imagine if the user clicked on something and one of these should be removed. So then there was only three items or imagine if there was a field they could type into and add another one in real time and then there would be a fifth item. Or imagine if they could edit the text for one of these. So they would need to change. What I'm saying is if in some way these the quantity or the text values or something about these was gonna change in real time, then you would absolutely want them to be based on context or state, in which case this would be the perfect approach. However, as of April 2024, I've ran into a lot of issues when trying to manage the class names for the direct child of a template like this. So in this case, the li list item. Right, like if I wanted to add a class for CSS reasons or remove a class for CSS reasons, I've ran into a lot of odd bugs. And I found that I actually needed to add like a weird, awkward interior wrapper to the li list item, like a span or a div, and then add and remove classes to that instead of the top level child of the template. Now, maybe I'm misunderstanding something. I think it's a bug, and I imagine the WordPress team will fix that bug uh, relatively soon. But for that reason, and not only for that bug reason, but also because our data uh, is not interactive in the sense that we're not going to need to update any of these. We're not going to have to add a new one or remove one. So not just for that CSS class bug reason, but also because there's no need for these LIs um, to constantly re update reactively based on context or state. So all I'm trying to say is that I wanted this tool to be in your toolbox, right? Sometimes you will absolutely want to use uh, a template with data dash WP each. But in this case, I wanna show you an entirely different approach. So do this with me. Inside the unordered list, let's entirely delete the template. And I just wanna show you how in this case, I would blend both traditional PHP with the interactivity API. I've found this approach to be much more elegant and I haven't ran into a single bug. So in the hollowed out unordered list, just drop into PHP and then we can close out of PHP. In between, uh, let's just use a for each loop. What are we going to loop through? Simple, just look in dollar sign attributes and then look inside that for answers and then loop through that as, and then let's just say like a uh, singular, right? Like this could be anything, this could be dollar sign pizza, but this is the current singular instance that's been looped to. At the end of that closing parentheses, let's have curly brackets. Uh, in between the curly brackets, we can drop down. And now on the end of this line, I would drop out of PHP and then right before this, uh, closing curly bracket right here, just go back into PHP. And then right here where my cursor is now, we are free to have HTML. So for each item, I would just have an LI, close out the LI, and then in between here, I would just go back into PHP and echo out, uh, you know, singular answer, and then close out of PHP. Let's save that and see what that gets us. So if I refresh, cool. I mean, that gives us the exact same thing because we're not needing to remove or add items or edit items in this list. And now, watch how easy it is to tie the interactivity API back onto these. So like when you click on one, we do something. Check it out, all you would need to do is on the opening li tag, just say data dash wp on dash dash click equals quotes, and then just actions. And we named it, was it guess attempt? Let me look in view.js. Yes, guess attempt. So actions dot guess attempt. If I save that and open up your console and then refresh, be sure to refresh. And now when I click on Moo, uh, so I was three steps ahead of myself. I've had too much coffee this morning, but I'm actually really glad that we don't see the item that we just clicked on uh, in the console. What are we seeing instead? Well, this is the context. And this is the perfect situation in time to explain how context gets merged in the interactivity API. So let's, let's explain what's going on here. In our Vue.js file, uh, you know, we're getting context and then we're logging that to the console. Now, what are we seeing in the console? What's getting logged? What's the context? 
we're seeing everything, right? We're seeing the question, we're seeing the array of answers, we're seeing the correct answer, the BG color, right? Everything. And let me show you where that's coming from. In render.php, on the overall parent div, remember at the end of that we are outputting the context. What I want to show you right now though is the super intelligent way that the interactivity API merges context. It's really cool. It's tied to the DOM, you know, and like children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. Essentially, it works from the inside out. So grandchildren elements, they have access to their own context, but also any of their parents and grandparents and great grandparents context. So when you click on this list item, because it's nested in the DOM in this overall div, and this is the div that's setting that, that big picture context, the list item has access to its grandparents context. However, when we click on a list item, we would also want um, the context to contain which specific item got clicked on. Like, did we click on meow or did we click on bark? So on and so forth. So what's cool is the way that WordPress merges the context. Let me explain. So on the opening list item tag, we could say like data-wp context equals single quotes and then, you know, like give it an object. And let's just say like sky color, col actually, I think you're supposed to wrap that as in double quotes, but like sky color, double quotes, colon, uh, let's give it a value of like blue. Okay, now save that. And now if we refresh and click on any of these, I mean, they're all gonna be sky color blue, but when you click on meow, well, the interactivity API is smart enough to realize which DOM element I clicked on, so it's customizing the output. So we only see sky color, but I can assure you, you can access anything. The context object is actually merged with the grandparent context element. So you could say like context dot uh, correct answer. Right, and if you save and refresh, click on one, you see the correct answer index of two, or you could say like, you know, context.bg color. You can test that out, click on one. So the idea is that uh, within the context, now it contains all of its great grandparents' context, but also it gets merged with its own local context, uh, which in this case is sky color. Why is this so cool? Why am I so excited by this? Because now it means that it's very easy for us to compare, right? Like we can see, is this the correct answer? You can literally just compare like context, correct answer, you know, with uh, context dot, you know, whatever one got clicked on. So it makes our logic, our business logic very easy. We can compare values. We can look at uh, grandparent values. We can look at the children values. Uh, this is just going to make things really easy. Whether we're looking for something super close to home or up the family tree five levels, it's all available within our context. WordPress handles merging the context for us. Now, at this point, let's change gears a little bit. Uh, let's work on actually being able to decide if the one that you clicked on is correct or not. Now, at this point, there's a million different ways that you could accomplish that. And if you asked 100 different developers how they would do it, you would get 100 different answers. So for the remainder of this lesson, this has maybe a little bit less to do with the interactivity API, and this is more just an explanation of how I personally would set this up. So let's zoom out a little bit and get some big picture perspective here. If I go into the elements and look at the top level div, right, and look at our context, simply because of the way that our editor side of the block stores which answer is the correct answer, and what I mean by that is if you look at correct answer, it's not storing the value of like meow or bark. It's storing the array index position number of the correct answer. So it's going to be really easy for us to just compare the array index of the answer that just got clicked on with that correct answer index. So with that in mind, if you go back into render.php, I would want to give each list item, right? That's what's going to get clicked on. I would want to give each one of those a piece of context um, with its array position number. Then we could compare that with the correct one. Now, sure, maybe you could get creative with JavaScript and set that up, but let me show you what I would do. I'm just gonna lean on my old friend, PHP. So actually up here, we can get rid of this area where, where I mean, you could leave this if you want to, the print R, just for that debugging uh, info of what's in the array of attributes, but I don't need that any longer, so I'm gonna get rid of that. But I am gonna have a PHP block. And technically, you could just include that up here, right? Uh, the boilerplate code already has a PHP block that starts here and ends here. So right about here uh, is where I'm going to write a bit of PHP. I'm going to do two things. First of all, I'm going to, and this could be named pizza, so dollar sign for a PHP array. It could be named anything, but let's say like dollar sign uh, answers equals an array semicolon. And then below that, let's have, and again, I'm just making this up. It could be named unicorn, but let's name it like dollar sign 
our context equals an array semicolon and then let's just start spelling out pieces of data that we know that we know we're going to need like for example uh, one named solved and then an associative array in PHP set that to false, right? Like when the page first loads, the quiz question has not been solved yet, so it's false. Later on, we can set that to true when we want to display like the finished results of, you know, showing like a check mark or a red X next to answer, so on and so forth. This is where I would also set things like, you know, show the congrats screen. I would set that to false. I would say like show the sorry screen. I would set that to false. I would have a, a property called correct answer and just set that to equal and then just look in dollar sign attributes and look in that array for quotes correct answer. The idea here is that in this array that I named our context, I'm spelling out the exact items that I want on this top level div for the context and only those items. For example, uh, if you look in the browser, we don't need things like BG color to live in our context. I mean, it's not hurting anything, but the point is, I want to take matters into my own hands and create this perfectly crafted bit of data, and I want that to be my context. Now, the ultimate goal of this has to do with this array that I named answers. So in our context, let's be sure to pass that along as well. So it doesn't matter if it's at the start of the beginning, but let's have, you know, quotes, let's call answers and set that to equal our dollar sign answers array, comma. So the idea now is that I want to perfectly control the shape of the data of the answers. Let me explain what I mean here. Instead of just an array of strings that's literally meow, bark, oink, and meow, I want to give them a, a property of text with that value, but also a property of index with that easy to access array position number. Later on, we can also use this to say whether they should have a green check mark or a red X, uh, but let's not get too many steps ahead of ourselves. So on a line in between these two lines, I'm just going to customize this array. So on this line, I would have a for loop. So parentheses, curly brackets. In the parentheses, I would have dollar sign i equals zero, semicolon, dollar sign i as long as it's less than, and then I would count dollar sign attributes, look inside that for answers. Okay, and then after the closing square brackets and one of the closing parentheses, semicolon, and then just increment dollar sign i. So dollar sign i plus plus. Cool, so just a classic for loop. And essentially what I'm going to do is loop through all of our different answers and then just add them to this array, but give them different bits of data. Essentially, if this was JavaScript, I would use map to build a new array based on an old array. I realize that PHP has a map function, but to tell you the truth, I'm not as strong in PHP as I am in JavaScript. So this is just a sloppy way of achieving the same thing. But I would say like dollar sign answers, right? This array that we're trying to build and I would look inside that, so square brackets for uh, the current item that's been, or excuse me, like the index. So the first time this runs, this will be zero. So we're essentially saying like in position number zero, the first position in this array, let's add something to it. So I would look inside that item for an add an associative array item called index. This could be anything, pizza, unicorn, but I'm calling it index. And I'll just set that to dollar sign I semicolon. Now let's have another one uh, with just the simple text. So I'll say like, uh, answers. I mean, you could actually just copy and paste this line to save typing. Instead of index, I'd set this to text. And then for its value, this would be like dollar sign attributes. Look inside it for answers. Look inside that uh, for dollar sign I. Essentially, I'm just moving over the string value into a property named text. And then while we're here, uh, this is getting maybe a few steps ahead of ourselves, but I'm also going to uh, paste in another duplicate copy of that line. And I'm going to call this property correct. So this will store whether the current answer is correct or not. I'm going to use this a bit later to show either a green check mark or a red X icon. But essentially for the value, this would either be true or false, right? So you can just use the equal equal sign comparison in operator in PHP. So I would say like dollar sign attributes, look inside that for correct answer, right? So that's the index value. It's either going to be zero, one, two, three, some sort of number. And so just does that equal dollar sign i, the current answer that's been looped to. Okay, so now each item in this answers array has the exact data that we would want. And more importantly, our, our context has the exact data that we, that we would want. Like we don't need BG color, it only has the things that we need. So now let's go use this as our context. So down on our opening parent div, uh, let's find where we're adding the context, right? Echo WP interactivity context, instead of having attributes as the context, let's use dollar sign and we named it our context. 
Let's save that, and if I refresh and inspect that opening parent div, beautiful, there we see data WP context, and now it doesn't have things like BG color or things that we don't need. It only has that exact shape of data that we actually know we're going to need. So answers is an array, and each answer has now an index, text, and then a property of correct that is either true or false. So now this is gonna be really, really, really easy to set up the logic like when you click on one of these, right? So now when you click on meow or any of these, we don't just want sky color blue. Let me show you what we're gonna do. Let's go back into render.php. Let's find that list item that you're clicking on, right? This li tag, that's what has the event handler. Aha, right here, data wp on click guess attempt. We'll check this out. We don't just want the context for this local uh, grandchild element to be sky color blue. So get rid of not only that value, but even get rid of the data WP context and do this instead. So right where my cursor is, this would is where you could normally have like an attribute of class or one of these data WP attributes, but let's use PHP. So jump into PHP here, close out, say echo, and then it's WP interactivity, yes, this one. Uh, we've already used it up above on the opening div, so you don't need to type it out again if you don't want to, but it's interactivity data WP context, parentheses to call it. And now this is really cool because we're in a PHP loop, the singular instance that we've currently looped to is already available from dollar sign answer. So that's what you would give it here is just dollar sign answer. And more importantly, let's change what we're looping through in this for each. We no longer want to loop through just the raw attributes of answers, we want to loop through our data. So instead of attributes, I would loop through dollar sign our context, right? And then it has the associative array item named answers. Now again, if you needed your list to actually update based on state, like add an extra list item, remove a list item, edit the text in a list item, you wouldn't use this approach. You would use the template data WP each method that we saw in our previous lesson. But if we go ahead and save this, and if I refresh, whoops, warning, array to string conversion on line 29. Ah, yes, line 29. So when we're actually outputting the text that you see on screen for each list item, instead of just answer, now answer is not just a string, now it's an array. So you would look inside that array for the property named text. Cool, so if we save that and refresh, cool. But now when you click on one and look in the console, Cool, so instead of just the text value of the one you clicked on, we see the index value. Now, I realize you might be saying, Brad, why do we need to have the index to compare to the correct answer if we literally have a property <laughs> named correct, true, or false, right? Like if I correct, click on the correct answer, we see correct is true. Well, that would be a great question, and that's just a bit of oversight on my part. Uh, I actually only wanted this correct, true, or false property to show either a green check mark or a red X, and I couldn't think of a more elegant solution at the time. So <laughs> do as I say, and maybe not as I do. You wouldn't actually need to preemptively uh, calculate this. You could definitely use client-side JavaScript, and that's what I would su suggest you do, to compare um, the correct answer index to the one that got clicked on. So for now, let's use our imagination and pretend that correct, true, or false didn't exist. Like imagine uh, we only saw this when we were uh, clicking on an item. Here's what we would do. Let's bring this lesson to a close. I would go into my Vue.js file in our guess attempt, and I would just um, compare, you know, console.log, I would compare context.index, does that equal sign, so double equal sign, or, you know, even triple equal sign to check for equality, does that equal context.correct answer? Cool, let's save that. So that's gonna log either true or false. So if you refresh, if I click on meow, we see false, if I click on oink, false, let me not click on bark yet. If I click on move, false. And finally, if I click on bark, we see true. Beautiful. At this point, we have everything we need to now make a ton of progress. In our next lesson, we're going to show the message like, congrats, that's correct, or sorry, that's incorrect. And then we'll show the green check mark, the red X, and we will bring this interface to life. I'll see you in the next lesson very soon. Hello, everyone. In this lesson, we're going to actually react to the user getting a question right or wrong. So we can show either the congrats message or the sorry message. Let's jump into the action. All right, so in a previous lesson, we set things up with the interactivity API so that when you click on an incorrect answer, we see false in the console. If you click on the correct answer, we see true. So now instead of just logging false or true, let's actually show the appropriate congrats or sorry message in this block. So back in our text editor, in the SRC folder, jump into view.js. 
we're looking for our guess attempt action function. And let's be sure to have our, in the command line, our npm start task up and running. Cool. All right, now instead of just logging true or false to the console, let's instead use this same decision or comparison, but let's, you know, have like an if else block. So to save some typing, you could just copy the inner contents of this, uh, the parentheses for console.log, copy that into your clipboard, and then get rid of the console.log. And instead, let's have an if parentheses, curly brackets, and then right after that, let's have an else curly brackets. Now, for the condition, you can just paste in your clipboard, okay, and then in the curly brackets, if that is true, uh, let's show the congrats message. So I would just say context dot show congrats equals true. If you're wondering how I came up with this name of show congrats, I made it up, but it's also coming from render.php. Uh, up towards the top of render.php, remember when I built out our custom our context uh, PHP array and then uh, WordPress will output that into JavaScript syntax for us, but I included properties like uh, solved, show congrats, show sorry, and I initialized them to have a value of false. So now we're just setting that to true. And then else, uh, if you get it wrong, let's say context show sorry and set it to equal true. Cool, let's save that. And now that on its own won't do anything because nothing in our render.php file, right, in our interactivity API markup, none of this code is dependent on that piece of context or those two pieces of context of show congrats or show sorry. So right now, let's add maybe below our unordered list, like right about here, let's add in the HTML that, you know, that should be visible if you get the question wrong. So remember I was borrowing code from this light themed uh, text editor, and this was the previous version of the plugin that we coded in an earlier chapter in the course. So in that folder, if you go into SRC and then go into frontend.js, I'm just going to look for the, the UI or the HTML that should display when you get it wrong. So for me, it's around line 68, right? But there's a div that has a class name of incorrect message. Now this is using the React syntax. We don't need to use that. We can just say class equals instead of class name, but this is a good starting point. So I would select from the start of that div. And then right after the closing P, there's just one closing div tag. We don't need both closing div tags, just one. And I would copy that into my clipboard, okay? And then back in VS Code, uh, maybe just right below, uh, our unordered list, just paste in your clipboard. Let's change this. So instead of class name, it should just be class equals. And actually to tell you the truth, we don't want any of this uh, curly bracket that comes after the equal sign. So like get rid of that entire bit from the opening curly bracket to the closing curly bracket. And let's just have it say class equals. We'll learn how to make this dynamic or depend on context in just a minute, but let's make sure that it's displaying correctly first. So let's say like class equals and it needs to be incorrect message and then a space incorrect message dash dash visible. Cool. Let's also just go through this SVG and make sure that we don't have any, yes, class name. Make sure that's just class equals. I think that should be it. Everything else should be great. So if we save that and refresh, cool. So even if you didn't get anything wrong, it just displays immediately. Every time you manually refresh, you're gonna just see it displaying because right now we didn't tell it to only be visible uh, based on context. We're telling it to just be visible, you know, just to make sure that it's looking good. So now what we would want to do is don't apply this dash dash visible class right out of the gate. So get rid of that. And we're going to only want to dis add that class conditionally depending on a piece of our context. And remember, context is just local state for this instance of the block. Now, luckily for us, WordPress has a really cool directive uh, that makes this easy. So on that same opening div, uh, instead of class, let's give it another attribute of data dash WP dash class. And now here's the cool part. So this is a WordPress a interactivity API directive, but then at the end of it, you can say dash dash. And now any class we add here, like pizza or unicorn, it's going to get added conditionally depending on uh, true or false that we give it. Let me explain. So like data WP class dash dash, and then the class that I want to manage is uh, incorrect message dash dash visible. So whatever comes after this WP class dash dash, I want this class to only be applied if, so now you say equals quotes, and then it's simple. It's just context dot show sorry. This may not seem like much, but the ability to essentially toggle a class on and off from a piece of context that you can easily mutate like this. I mean, 
I actually prefer this workflow over just plain React. I think the WordPress interactivity API was very intelligently designed. This is very easy to work with. So if we save that, let's test it out. So if I refresh, we don't see the sorry message, but if I get the question wrong, whoops, nothing's happening. Let's go look for a typo. Ah, so I just found it off camera. You might have been yelling at the screen. So in render.php, for me up around line uh, 19, where I'm setting our context, I have a pretty funny typo. Uh, so I said show sorry, and I have three R's instead of two R's in the word sorry. So if I just correct that so it matches, let's try this. So if I save that and refresh and get it wrong on purpose, beautiful. However, if I try to get the question wrong again, you'll notice that the message doesn't appear again. This is because we need to remove that class when we're done with it uh, so that we can add it again and that animation or transition will appear. Let me show you what I have in mind here. So go back into view.js. And where we're setting show sorry to true, well, then right after that, but still in that same else block, let's just set a timeout. So A comma B, the, let's actually fill in the B placeholder first. Let's wait uh, 2600 milliseconds. So just a little over two and a half seconds. And then uh, for A, just give it an arrow function. What do we want to do? We just want to put it to false. So context.show sorry equals false. Let's give that a save, refresh. So now if I get it wrong on purpose, Cool, we wait for that message to disappear and I get it wrong again. Absolutely perfect. Now let's go set up uh, the show congrats message for when you actually get it right. So we just need to go back into render.php, right below our unordered list, maybe right above the incorrect message, so right about here, let's add the correct message or the congrats uh, div. So back in the code that we're borrowing from, back in uh, the previous version that we built together, uh, right above that selected div, you'll see this one of the class name of correct message. And actually, I'm realizing it would probably be a lot easier to not even borrow this code yet. We can come back to the screen in just a minute. The only unique thing we need is the actual uh, SVG and paragraph. But let's do this. Back in VS Code, let's just duplicate this incorrect message div. So copy that into your clipboard right above it. Just paste it in. And then just change the class from incorrect to just correct message. And then let's change this. So this modifier class would be correct message visible. And then the piece of context we're looking for instead of show sorry would be show congrats. Cool. Now let's be sure to update the SVG in paragraph. So back in the, the editor that we're borrowing from, we don't need the wrapper div, just the SVG in paragraph. So copy that back in VS code. Let's just update that SVG in P tag. All right, and then I'm gonna be sure to remove class name off the SVG. You don't even need these classes at all, but the idea is that class name is only for React, not the interactivity API. Let's give this a save and test it out. So if I refresh, I get it wrong, cool. Let's wait for that to disappear, and then if I try to get it right, awesome. However, notice that after you get it right, if you click on a wrong answer, it still registers as a wrong answer, and we don't want that. We want it so that once you get the question correct, uh, the block is essentially done, and clicking on any further answers doesn't do anything. So to set up that logic, I'll let you know that back in render.php, in our initial context, we already set up a piece of context called solved, and by default, it's set to false. So once you answer it correctly, let's just change this piece of context to be true. Let me show you what I have in mind here. Back in view.js, if you get it correctly, let's do this. Not only show congrats to true, but let's also say context.solved and set that to true. Then I would just wrap this entire if else block, right? Uh, this entire block of code that evaluates if it's correct or not, I would just wrap all of this in an if check that checks to see if solved is false. If it's true, just don't execute this decision at all. So to do that, I would just uh, select from the start of this if until the closing else block. Cut that into your clipboard temporarily. We're going to want it in five seconds from now and just say if parentheses curly brackets, the decision would be if context.solved. And then to check for the opposite of that, just have an exclamation at the start of it. So we're saying only if it hasn't already been solved. And then inside the if block, just paste in your clipboard. Let's save this and give it a try. So if I refresh, Okay, I can get it wrong. Let me try to get it correct. Cool, let's let that fade away. Now if I try to get it wrong again, or you know, or get it right, either way, now none of the clicks register. Perfect. Now let's take it one step further. Uh, once you solve uh, the question, we should sort of fade the incorrect answers out of view. 
they should have a red X next to them, and then the correct answer should have a green check mark. So let's actually start with those icons, either the red X for the wrong answers or the green check mark for the correct answer. To set that up, let's go into our render.php file, and let's find our list item that's getting clicked on. So here's the end of the opening tag, and here's the closing tag. So this is the content that's actually displaying for each one. So right before we jump into PHP, like right here, I mean, you can test out that you're in the correct spot by just putting like the letter X. And then if you save and refresh, so the idea is that once the quiz is solved, and only once it's solved, instead of an X, we want an appropriate icon. A red X for the wrong answer is a green X, or excuse me, a green check mark for the correct answer. However, we don't want this to display when you first load the page, only once you've actually solved the question. So here's what I would do. And again, there's like 10 or 100 different ways you could set this up. But instead of the X, uh, I would just have a span. So opening and closing span. Now on the opening tag, I'm going to say, so an attribute, right? Like instead of class, just an attribute. And the attribute is going to be data.wp-bind-hidden. I'll explain what this means in just a second. But for now, let's set it to equal and then quotes. And let's say exclamation context dot solved. So in other words, we're saying only if the question hasn't already been solved. The exclamation means the opposite. Now this might seem backwards, but it's because this is to hide the element. If you're wondering what this does, data WP bind dash dash hidden. Essentially, in HTML, if you add, uh, so for example, like you know how any element, element you can say class equals, you can just have an attribute of hidden, like hidden equals true, but you don't need the equals true. If you just say hidden on any HTML5 element, it will be hidden. So this is the interactivity API way of uh, what if you give it a true or false value, like only if it's a true value, then it will have the hidden attribute. So inside this span, you could test it out. Now you could put the letter X there and then save and refresh. So notice how we don't see the X, but as soon as we get the question correct, well, cool, now you see the X's. So now we want something conditional. So inside that span, instead of the hard-coded X, um, you could actually drop down like this. And now I'm going to want to show one icon if it's an incorrect answer and a, another icon if it is the correct answer. Let's start with the correct answer, the green check mark. So inside, right now we're nested inside a span. I'm actually going to have two additional spans. So there's the first additional span. There's the second span. This will be for the correct green check mark, and this will be for the red X for the incorrect answers. So on the first span, I'm going to say this: data wp bind dash dash hidden equals quotes. Whoops, not hidden. Uh, two D's, not two E's. And then I haven't had my third coffee for the day. So right now I'm having a hard time figuring out if it would be context dot correct or exclamation context correct. We can flip this if it's not the behavior we would expect. Uh, but essentially, if you're wondering where this is coming from, if you look up here, remember um, each of the list items or each of the potential answers has a property or a piece of context on it uh, called correct, which will either be true or false. And because this span is lit, uh, nested inside of this LI, well, remember the LI has context about each answer. And that's available to the interactivity API. You can test this by just right clicking on one of the list items and looking at your um, Chrome tools inspector, right? And here you can see I'm highlighting it down here. That it has context, this JavaScript context of like index, text, and correct. So it will have access uh, to either true or false. So inside this span, let's go get that green check mark icon. So from our old code that we're borrowing from, uh, let's look for the check mark. So in our old blocks, uh, frontend.js file, it's around line 47. You see this SVG. Just copy that into your clipboard. And then let's paste it in here inside this span. So right here. And then let's make sure that we don't have any. Yes, instead of class name, just set this to class. And to tell you the truth, we don't even need this at all. So you could get rid of that class entirely. But let's save this and see if this logic is what we would expect or if we need to reverse it. So if you refresh, if I get the question correct, let's let that fade away. Beautiful. So the logic was correct. The true or false was what we would expect. So now you would just want the red X for the other ones. So let's set this up. Let's go back into our old code that we're borrowing from. The SVG for the red X would be around line 52. You would just copy that into your clipboard. Back in VS Code. This second span, this empty span, I would just say uh, data WP bind dash dash hidden. And then it would just be the opposite of this. So no exclamation, just context correct. Okay, and then inside that span, just paste in your clipboard with the SVG icon, 
and let's get rid of the class name attribute and value pair. Let's give that a save and test it out. Let's refresh if I get it right. Awesome. Well, good news and bad news. We see the X icon, but it's green instead of red. And also, we want the wrong answers uh, to look faded in terms of their transparency. And we also want to remove this hover effect where it lights up once the quiz has been solved. Let's take care of those various details in our next lesson. And in the next lesson, we're also going to learn about something in the Interactivity API, if you look in your Vue.js file, called a callback. We can use callbacks to perform more complex logic uh, when you're trying to check if more than one thing is true or false. Don't worry, I realize there's a lot of concepts and vocabulary swirling around right now, but once we put the finishing touches on our block, I think it's all going to start to come together and make sense. I'll see you in that next lesson very, very soon. Hello everyone. In this lesson, we're going to learn about something called a callback within the Interactivity API. Let's jump into the action. All right, so before we actually get to callbacks, let's take care of a quick attention to detail. So if I get this question correct, notice that for a split second, you're gonna see the icons before the congrats message appears. Notice when I click it, see for that split second. So we don't want those icons to, to appear, uh, if I refresh, until this message is blocking it. So that way you don't awkwardly see the icons appear. Uh, so let me show you how I would fix this. And this has nothing to do with callbacks. We'll get to callbacks in a few minutes from now. Here's what I would do. In my view.js file, when I'm setting context solved to true, I would just wait maybe one second before actually setting it to true. So here's what you could do. Take this line where we're saying context solved true, cut that into your clipboard, and in its place, let's say set timeout uh, A comma B. For B, just give it like one second, and then for A, just give it an arrow function, and then just paste back in your clipboard. Cool. Let's give this a save and test it out. So be sure to refresh. And now notice that when I get it correct, we don't see those icons appear, but then once the congrats message is gone, they're just conveniently there. Cool, so that perfected the timing. Now let's get on to the actual task at hand. So the green X is for the wrong answers. This should be a red X, not a green X. Uh, but also the incorrect answer should be faded and the correct answer should not have the hover effect when you hover over it. Now, to make all of that happen, I can let you know that we already have a few CSS classes. So for example, just to show you what it's going to look like, if I click on this meow li, and if I use my dev tools to down here, and if I just say class equals quotes and give it a class of fade dash incorrect, press enter. Notice how the SVG becomes red. Also, the answer is faded out. It doesn't have a hover effect. Uh, the cursor, the mouse cursor, no longer looks like a link, so on and so forth. So we want all wrong answers to have that class of fade incorrect, but we only want to give it to them at the correct time. And then for a correct answer, uh, if you inspect that LI or edit that LI, we would want to give it a class of, so class equals quotes. And obviously, this is just your dev tools. I'm just giving you a preview. It would be no dash click. And all that does is so that when you hover over the answer, it doesn't look like a link any longer. Cool. So let me show you how I would set this up. If you go into render.php and let's find the opening li tag. So for me, it's around line 29. So we want to give it a class, but instead of just saying class equals quotes, we want it to be a class that gets added or removed on the fly based on a piece of context or state. In the interactivity API, to do that, you say data dash wp dash class, and then dash dash, and then the name of the class you want. Could be pizza, could be unicorn. In our case, it's fade dash incorrect. So equals quotes, and now you give it a value of either true or false. However, this is where we're going to talk about what in the world is a callback, because you cannot give this more than just one condition. Let me explain what I'm getting at here. So you might think, hey, let's just give it a, a true or false value of like uh, context dot correct, or like the opposite of that, right? So exclamation, so save that and refresh. So that sort of works, right? We're giving that class of fade incorrect to the wrong answers, but we don't want that to appear until you've actually gotten the question correct, until you've actually solved the question. You know, so then you might think, oh, okay, Let's just only show this class uh, once context.solve this true. So you save and refresh and get it right. Uh, but then that's going to apply to all of them. So that's not what we want. So what you would really want is to combine both of those two things we just tried, right? So exclamation context.correct 
like and and uh, context.solved. However, you can't include an expression like this. It has to just be a one singular true or false value. Like if I save, this is going to create an error. It's not going to work. See, and our JavaScript just doesn't work at all now. If you look in the console, you'll see a JavaScript error. So this is where a callback comes into play. So let's undo that. When you have a bit of complex complex logic, uh, something more than just a single value that's true or false, you want to store that logic in a callback. So what you would actually do here, let's empty out these quotes. So this attribute is correct. Uh, data WP class dash dash fade incorrect. And then we just give it a callback. So in these quotes say callbacks dot, and then just make up a name. It could be pizza or unicorn. Let's call it like faded class. Okay, let's give that a save. And now you just go into your view.js file. And you know how we've been working on guess attempt in the actions area? If you scroll down, uh, there's a callbacks area. And this is the one that the boilerplate adds right above that. Let's just create one. We named it faded class. So colon uh, arrow function. Be sure to have a comma after that function. OK, and now check this out. Let's say const context equals. Let's get the context. And then you just return either true or false. So this is where you can have your complex logic, though. I mean, you could be making your decision within this callback on like 50 different factors, complex logic, and then you just return a Boolean, right? A true or false value. So we would just return uh, if context.solved and two ampersands and exclamation context correct. So only if it's a wrong answer and if the quiz has already been solved do we want to return true. So you can save that. Refresh. Let's try this out. So if I solve the question, see what happens. Perfect. So that applies for the three wrong answers. However, notice that when I hover over the correct answer, it still lights up and looks like a clickable link. So let's just set up a similar callback, maybe right above it. And you could to save a bunch of typing by just copying and pasting and duplicating faded class right above it. Instead of faded class, let's give it a name of like uh, no click class. Okay, leave this. You're going. Yes, you are going to want to get context, and then just uh, for returning true or false. The only difference is we don't need the exclamation for context correct. So only if the current item is correct and you've solved the quiz. So save that, and then go into render.php, and then either right after or right before this attribute and value, we'll just have it again. But we'll say data wp class dash dash, and its name is no dash click. So this is only for the correct answer. So I'd say equals quotes, and then it's callbacks dot, would we name it? I believe no click class. Yes, no click class. OK, no click class. Let's give that a save, refresh. Let's test this out. So if I get it right, let that fade away. Cool. Now I can no longer hover over it. It doesn't look like a link. It doesn't change styles. So in other words, we're adding the, the perfect class at the perfect moment. Uh, and so whenever you have a bit of complex logic, something more complex than just a single Boolean value, it's a really good option to use a callback. For a bit of extra credit, so I'm not going to walk through it with you, but for extra credit, if you went into render.php, you might be realizing, hey, couldn't I use a callback uh, instead of having this awkward um, like nested span? Right, to show whether you want to show the SVG for the X or the SVG for the check mark, we had one overall span that just checked to see if the question had been solved or not. And then nested inside that, we had another condition of whether that answer was correct or not. So you could get rid of that whole messy, you know, double nested span structure by just using callbacks directly on the SVGs. I think that would be a good bit of extra credit, a great practice exercise for you to set up if you want to go that extra mile. Cool. In our next lesson, uh, let's learn what in the world state is used for instead of context. So imagine uh, instead of just one uh, question block type, like in the editor, right? What if you had like five different questions? And then what if maybe above or below all those different instances, you wanted an, a block that said uh, you have successfully answered three questions correctly so far, or four questions correctly so far. Some sort of block that kept track of that global page state of how many of these different block instances have been solved. Well, in our next lesson, we're going to set up that new block type. And it's the perfect example to really wrap our minds around, OK, well, we know what context is, but what in the world is state for? I think this is going to be a lot of fun to set up and seeing how um, your specific block instance can interact with the page as a whole, this is really going to open up the possibilities. I think you're going to brainstorm 20 new ideas for cool blocks that you want to create 
on your own. I'm so excited to jump into this with you. Let's keep our momentum rolling and I will see you in our next lesson. Hello everyone. In this lesson, we're going to answer the question, when should we use state instead of context? Because up until this point, when working with the Interactivity API, we've only used context for everything. Surely there must be a time and place when state is the correct tool for the job, right? Well, yes, of course. Let's jump into the action. Okay, so off camera, all I've done is created two more instances of the quiz block type, right? So we have the first one we've been working on, then I added uh, this second instance and this third instance. So off camera, or if you want to pause this lesson, just go into the admin editor screen and make sure you have at least, you know, two or three or more uh, instances of our multiple choice question. Cool. So what is our goal for this lesson? I want to have a brand new block type that you could add anywhere, maybe, uh, you know, above all the questions or down below all the questions or wherever you wanted to have it. And it's going to be, uh, it keeps track of the count of how many questions you've successfully answered. So when you first load the page, it's going to say zero, uh, you know, but when I get this one right, it would say one. And then when I get this one, it would bump up to two and then bump up to three or however many. So essentially just a new block type uh, that keeps a running tally of how many instances of this block type have completed. This is the perfect example of when you would want to use state instead of context, because context is only for that one instance of a block type. So this first question, its context is only, uh, you know, these answers and this correct question. This next block, it only has in terms of its context access to itself. So anytime you need to do something that's bigger than the current instance of the block you're working on, bigger than itself, Right? And you're trying to see like how does it interact with the page itself or the other blocks on the page or other copies of that block instance, that's when you need to use state instead of context. Enough chat for now. Let's get into the action. Let's go create a brand new block type and a brand new plugin uh, in addition to this one, right? So how would you do that? Simple. Open up the plugins folder for your installation. So for me, this is my local WP site. Click on go to site folder and then go into app go into public, go into WP content, go into plugins. It actually, you know what, don't even go into plugins. Let's just drag this plugins folder on top of our terminal. So here's my terminal. In your terminal type CD and then a space and then drag your plugins folder onto your terminal, press enter. And now here's a command that we're gonna run together. This is the exact same command from several lessons ago, right? But it's npx at symbol WordPress slash create dash block at latest, then a space. And now this could be pizza, this could be unicorn. Uh, it's just essentially a short name or folder name for your new block type or your new plugin. I'll name it like solved counter or maybe dash, like solved dash counter. And then we wanna say dash dash template. And then it's at symbol WordPress slash create dash block dash interactive dash template. Go ahead and press enter and that shouldn't, take more than like 20, 30 seconds. Okay, once it finishes, then just go into your plugins folder and then you should see a brand new folder. Here it is for me named solved counter. Go ahead and open that up in VS code. All right, in VS code, let's go into the SRC folder and then jump into render.php. Cool, so this is just the boilerplate code, uh, but if you wanted to, just to make it painfully obvious that this is our new code, maybe above the button inside the div here, you could have like a heading level one that says, hello. Let's go ahead and save that and then be sure in your command line to have the npm start task up and running. So with that running, you could click save just one more time. Now let's go activate the plugin. So in the admin dashboard, uh, just go to your plugin screen. So for me, I need to scroll all the way down to the bottom, but there it is, solved counter. Go ahead and activate that. And now let's go try to add it to our blog post, right? So I've been working on this one called yet another post. Right, there's my three instances of the quiz, maybe up at the top. Um, so maybe like before the three quizzes, that's when I'll insert it. So let me insert, uh, if I search for solved, right? It's called solved counter, go ahead and click that. Now we don't really care what the admin experience looks like. Obviously you could customize that. We've already learned how to do that in a previous chapter. Let's go ahead and just click save or update that post and then refresh it on the front end. Cool, so there is the H1 hello, and then there's that toggle button. So now, um, that's the boilerplate. Now let's actually get to work. We would want this to say something like, you have successfully solved this many answers or this many questions. And then it starts out as zero, but then when you get this one right, it would bump up to one, then it would bump up to two, 
then it would bump up to three, so on and so forth. So how in the world do we do that? How do we connect the dots between different block types and different instances of blocks, so on and so forth? Well, the answer is state. Now, before we worry about how this block can access state, let's first worry about how these blocks can change the state. So let's initialize and then worry about changing it, and then we'll worry about reading it here. So in other words, back in VS Code, let's temporarily not worry about this new plugin or block we're creating that I named solve counter, and instead jump back into the VS Code where you have the other folder opened. Right, so my folder is named interactivity quiz, but essentially open up the plugin folder for this block type for just another minute or so. Here's what we're going to do. In the SRC folder, jump into render.php. Let's scroll up to the top, and I actually want to write a bit of PHP. So you know up here where we have answers and our context? It doesn't matter where. It could be above or below that, but just anywhere in PHP. Let's do this. Let's say WP underscore interactivity underscore state, and then be sure to have a semicolon in parentheses to call it. Now, this is a really easy word for me to uh, misspell or have a typo in, so make sure you're spelling it correctly. Interactivity. Uh, but essentially, in these parentheses, we give it two things, so A comma B. The first thing we give it is the namespace that we're working with. Let me explain what in the world the namespace is. If you jump into your block.json file, uh, you'll see that around line number four, you have name. So it's create block forward slash interactivity quiz. So whatever comes before the forward slash, this is your namespace. Uh, this would be shared amongst like a theme or plugins. And then after the forward slash, this is the name of your specific block type that you're working on. So in this case, the namespace is create-block. So back in render.php, uh, instead of the A placeholder, it would just be quotes, create-block. This concept of a namespace will become crystal clear in about another minute or two. So hang in there. Uh, and then instead of the B placeholder, you give this a PHP array. And let's give it one property of like solved count. And again, I'm making this up. This could be pizza or unicorn. And then the associative array symbol, so just equals greater than. And then let's set it initially to zero. And now this is unnecessary, but just for your own practice or understanding, you could also say comma and say like uh, sky color. Whoops, put that in quotes. Sky color uh, equals greater than and set that to blue. Cool. So you can give that a save. And then if you refresh, nothing changes. However, so we just set up state in these blocks. Now let's try to access that state from within this new block type. So back in VS Code, switch back over to the new plugin, the solved counter plugin that we're building. Right where we have hello and then five exclamations. And let's just give ourselves a completely fresh, clean slate. So we don't need any of this. I'm actually going to delete the entire div, like so the very opening start of the div tag on line 17, and delete all the way down to line 41. We don't need any of this boilerplate code. Leave the closing PHP tag, but we do not need this unique paragraph. Cool. So be sure to closing PHP there. Let's give ourselves a clean slate. Let's have a div. Inside it, let's have a paragraph. And let's say uh, questions solved, colon. And then let's have like a strong tag, a bold tag. And then inside there, let's have a span. And then instead of typing something inside the span, on the opening span tag, let's say data WP text equals quotes. What is it going to be? State dot solved count. Now, if you try to save this, this will not work. There's one crucial detail that's missing. So just to prove the point, if you save and refresh, uh, we absolutely do not see the number zero there. The way that you connect the dots, and this is the really interesting part to me, has to do with that namespace that we saw just a couple of minutes ago. So remember, our namespace was create-block. So what you do, uh, wherever in the DOM you want to have access to that state, on your overall opening div, so we would just, on the opening div tag, we say data WP interactive. You're sort of initializing this entire portion of the DOM as a interactivity API area. So it's data WP interactive, and then in the quotes, you give it that namespace that you're wanting to be a part of or to work with. So create-block. We go ahead and save that, and now we refresh, we do indeed see the number zero. Beautiful. So that's how you sort of 
opt in um, to a namespace. And now all of your different block types, but more importantly, multiple instances of the same block can now communicate together using state. Anyways, to recap, the namespace is the glue that sort of holds all of that together. At this point, now that we are actually displaying that zero in the counter block, let's go back into these blocks and learn how to increment that value. Like how would we bump it up to one instead of zero when we get this question correct? So in VS Code, we need to hop back one more time to our interactive quiz. Cool. In that block type, the quiz block type, in the SRC folder, I want you to jump into view.js. Okay, so the idea is that we would want to increment that value from zero up to, you know, one or two or three every time you solve a question. So within our guess attempt, uh, if you get the question correct, we're saying like show congrats equals true and then set context solved to true. So this is the same area where we would just want to increment that piece of state. Now, in order to do that, the first step is to make sure that we have access to the variable that's named state. So this was how we got access to context, right? It's a little bit different to get access to state. Check this out. On this line, line number six, uh, the area that all of this code is nested within, right? We're saying store, and we're, we're accessing a store based on the namespace. So again, you're seeing how that namespace is really the glue that holds it all together, right? It's that matching namespace. At the start of line number six, you can see my cursor is right before the word store, we're gonna do this. We're gonna say const, and then have square, or excuse me, curly brackets to destructure an object, and then say equals, and then it just equals the store line. So all I added was this area. Now we're destructuring the object that, that this is going to give to us, and what we wanna pull out from it is state. Cool, so now we have access to a variable named state. So check this out, in this area where we're getting the question correct, right, where we're saying show congrats equals true, uh, maybe right above or below that line where you're saying show congrats equals true, just say state. We can access it now from that variable, state dot, and then let's look inside it for solved count and just bump it up, so plus plus to increment it. So let's save that and test it out. So be sure to refresh your front end. Uh, so cool, we see zero, but as soon as I get this question correct, it bumps up to one. If I get this question correct, it bumps up to two. If I get this question correct, awesome. Now there's one more detail I wanna take care of, and that is that what if for some reason you added this block to the page, but you didn't add any of these blocks type, block types to the page? In other words, I would want this to still be the number zero instead of just erroring out uh, because there aren't any questions to initially set that state number to zero. Now before we get to that detail, I want the way that state gets merged to make sense to you. And so right now I wanna make sure that we're logging something to the console. So check this out, uh, back in VS Code. In that same area where we're incrementing state, just right below it, just for debugging, let's say console.log state. Let's give that a save and refresh. And then if you get a question right, cool. So not only do you see solved count one, but you see sky color blue right, because that's the other piece of state that we set. Now what I wanna show you right now is, what if we also try to set solved count to zero initially from within this block type? Here's what we're going to do. Back in VS Code, in the interactive, interactive quiz uh, block, go into render.php and just copy this line up at the top in PHP uh, where we're saying WP interactivity state. Copy that entire line into your clipboard, okay? Then switch over to the solved counter VS Code and go into render.php, and up at the top in this PHP block, just paste in your clipboard. Cool, so we're setting solved count to zero, and this is fine. It's okay to do the same thing in multiple block types because state will be very intelligently merged together. So what I'm trying to show you is like, instead of sky color, you could say like grass color green. Go ahead and save that, refresh, and get a question correct. And in the command line, you'll see, or excuse me, the console, you'll see solved count one, Grass color green, sky color blue. And when you initially reload, obviously it's just successfully zero. So you can set or initialize state in multiple blocks and WordPress will handle intelligently merging the states together. The idea is that state is sort of this one single, really convenient global place. Now, we can test out uh, that edge case I was describing where if you had this solved counter for some reason, but none of these, now it's not going to run into an error because we've initialized its value to zero uh, from within its own block type and these 
So you could go into your editor and like delete all of your quizzes. You don't need to do this. You can just watch me do it. Uh, but let me delete all of those. So I realize this doesn't really make sense. You probably wouldn't want to solve the counter if you don't have any quizzes, but our block is resilient. So now if you refresh, we don't run into any errors. We're setting that to be zero as well, just from within this block itself. Cool. Anyways, that's an example of how you can use state to build really compelling, you know, multiple block types or multiple instances, setups and scenarios. And I think from here, the sky is the limit. And that is going to bring not only this lesson, but this chapter on the interactivity API basics to a close. However, I do want to talk about what's next. So as of April 2024, uh, this is not released yet. However, there is sort of a next step to the interactivity API that has not been merged into the core of WordPress yet. I'm hoping it will be soon. And you can believe that when it is added officially into the WordPress core and gets officially documented and supported, I will make lessons covering it. However, there is something called the interactivity router. Now, initially, this was part of the interactivity API total package. Uh, at some point, the WordPress development team sort of split it into its own separate package. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, but I guess for some reason it wasn't ready to sort of launch into the official core of WordPress quite yet. So I think it's still under development. However, this is what's going to really make sort of spa or single page application behaviors come to life. Uh, this is the final puzzle piece that's going to take the interactivity API even to another level. Essentially, wouldn't it be cool if you could have links that when you click on them, take you to sort of different pages and even adjusted the URL in the address bar, right? And then ties into the browser's history. So you could click like the back and forward button. So if you've ever worked with something like Next.js or like React Router, well, we're going to get something similar to that with the interactivity router. It may not be exactly similar, but it's going to let us accomplish some of those same things. And this is really going to propel front-end WordPress development to another level. I'm very, very, very excited for this feature. However, it is not a part of core WordPress yet. It is not officially launched. There's no official documentation or support for it. But when that time comes, you and I will dive into this. I'm so excited for that. I'll see you in the next lesson. Hey, thank you for watching this entire video. If you enjoyed this lesson, you might enjoy the full course that this was an excerpt from. Uh, so the full 44 hour WordPress course covers plugin development, theme development, and so much more. You'll find this link to join the full course in the description for this video. And the bundle also comes with my full stack dev course, my Laravel course, my MySQL course, and my React.js course. You also get access to the private Discord chat community. Thanks again for checking out this video and stay tuned for more web development tutorials.